I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. It'll be over by Christmas, many of the troops assured themselves. But it wasn't. Instead, the British Expeditionary Force had been exposed to the full might of the German army and all the brutal apparatus of industrial war. A 100,000 British soldiers had been killed or wounded. For many, Christmas Day was a day like any other. But some witnessed an event that stood out in the history of the war and in the years since has achieved a mythical status. We all knew it was Christmas, and we were expecting a Christmas parcel to come up in the rations. A bit extra, you know, which it did, really. Plum pudding, and didn't we get that uh, box of cigarettes from the Queen? Didn't we get them that year? Princess Mary box with cigarettes and tobacco. Mine's downstairs. Uh, They were dished out in time for Christmas Day. Apart from extra rations, Soldiers at the front in France and Belgium had little to look forward to. Dinner was likely to be bully beef, unless they could scavenge something from local farms. But at least the rain had stopped, and the ground had hardened. In Christmas time, when on the 24th of December, our feelings were not at all unfriendly feelings against the enemy. On the Christmas day, 1914, it was a beautiful day with a white frost. And that place looked beautiful in the sunshine when the sun came up. There was a feeling in the air, we can't go on killing each other today. And it was mutual feeling on both sides. I think it was because it was Christmas Day. That's why we had the armistice, because it was Christmas Day. At various points along the front line, a series of ceasefires spontaneously broke out. Historian Peter Hart carried out many of the interviews with veterans in the Imperial War Museum's collection. When you listen to the interviews, there's a real sense of what is going on, what are they like? It was a chance to meet, to talk to the enemy. It's a very powerful motivation, curiosity. And and this comes across all the time as you listen to their voices, the, the interest in what's going on the other side of the barbed wire. In Germany, Christmas Eve is the day of big family gatherings and gifts. So it was on Christmas Eve that the men of the Artists' Rifles, the London Regiment, became aware that something strange was happening. H.G.R. Williams and Henry Williamson. Well, I was on duty around about 11 o'clock. And all of a sudden I saw lights all along the German trenches, all coming up there, they were in sort of Christmas trees, and they started singing Christmas carols. They sang a silent night. Heilige Nacht. And after that, somebody, come over, Tommy, come over. And they still thought it was a trap. We all called the other chaps who were sleeping, called them to come along and look at this, and they all came there. And we started singing carols too. And one of the Germans said, Tommy, you come over here. And we said, no, Fritz, you come and see us. And anyway, we were, the singing went on for quite a long time. Some of us went over at once, and they came to this barbed wire fence between us, which was hung by uh, hung with empty bully beef tins. It would make a rattle if they came. And very soon we were exchanging gifts. I was amazed, and I was terribly, terribly sick at not having been up there to see it myself, never dreaming I was going to have the full works the next morning. (laughs) For some, the truce lasted a couple of hours. For others, it continued into the next day. Artillery officer John Wedderburn Maxwell was interviewed in 1985 by Lynn Smith for the Imperial War Museum Sound Archive. I went up and I met a small party who said, oh, come along into our trenches and have a look at us. I said, no, no, I'm quite, quite near enough as it is. You know, why didn't you take advantage of that offer? Because I was pretty certain I'd never come out of it again. Did you really? <laughs> well, see, we were 
50-50 out in the open, we're equally balanced, just about halfway between the two lines of defence. But if they'd got me in there, even as a youngster with only one star, I'd have been a very valuable prisoner of war. I think most accounts that we hear refer to the Germans initiating the truce. So they went to meet them because they couldn't allow the Germans too close to their trenches because they'd see what was going on. Both sides also engaged in improving their own trenches and you, you'll find people referring to getting a better dugout, things that it was easier to do when you didn't have to watch out for snipers. And there is another motivation. Uh, many of our British officers were out in no man's land trying to see the German trenches. It, it isn't all peace and love. Ten o'clock in the morning... Oh, Jerry, as we used to call him, got up and started to repair his trenches. Where in the open? Archibald Stanley was stationed in the Armentier area. We got out of our trenches and started to build our parapets up, you see. And all of a sudden, both of us walked together. And we met in no man's land. And uh, we shook hands, they were Saxons. And I heard one fellow chat talking English. I said to him, you speak English? You know what he said? Oh, blimey, mate, he said I was in the London Hotel when I walked back out. <laughs> He's got the London accent. Well turned out, clean, good uniforms, healthy. I oh, know they looked all right. There were some very young. There were one or two very young ones. One one was put in the kind of 18, if not younger. What were you talking to them about for half an hour? Can you remember the sort of gist? Well, just saying how bloody it was in, in that mud and how we hated it all and all that. And they, they said, we are Saxons, you are Anglo-Saxons, why are we fighting? We said the war's going to be over by Christmas and they said, well, we, that's what we tell our people. All your people tell you it's in heaven eyes. Troops were tentative. After months spent trying to kill each other, Organising a truce was a tricky business. Tragically, some men were shot trying to initiate a ceasefire. For those who didn't want to break cover, it did help that the trenches were close enough together for shouts to be heard. George Ashurst was in a trench with the Lancashire Fusiliers. It started by, well, Merry Christmas, lads, you know, talking in the trench. We can hear Jerry, he's chatting quite loudly this particular morning. And he's singing a Christmas carol, you know, in German. A damn good singing, too, and we're shouting, Go on, Jerry, you know. Encore, we're shouting. And a fellow come next, playing a cornet. Oh, God, it was a good one, too. And he was playing a, a carol with his cornet. It didn't half rattle out all them lands, you know. It was beautiful to hear him play it. Oh, it's shouting, hooray! And there's nobody shooting. About ten o'clock, so I have in the morning, or half past. A Jerry's walking across. And he's a stick with a white flag on it, you know. Of course, when he gets halfway, he stops, which he has to do, you know. So we sent a fellow out, brought him in. Well, he's a prisoner of war. When he gets in our lines, he's immediately a prisoner of war because he's not been blindfolded. So our officers had to tell him that he was a prisoner of war. Best thing it were for him it was, you know, if he only knew it. He played hell about it, but it made no difference, you know. Anyhow, the message said, like, could we have an armistice of two hours? From 11 o'clock till 1. And our people agreed. The whole of no man's land, as far as we could see, was grey and khaki. There they were smoking and talking, shaking hands, exchanging names and addresses after the war to write to one another. Because the Germans started burying their dead, which were frozen out, and we, we picked up ours and buried them. Who agreed this armistice? At what well, level of command? Was it the or colonel? Or our local commander, I suppose, the colonel in charge. And uh, whether he wired back headquarters, bear in mind, I don't know that. We're told no man must fire at a German after 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. What did you think of that when you were told that? Okay, well, that was very nice, you know. And uh, 
it came eleven o'clock, of course, and we'd been standing up on the fire and parapet, you know, and nobody was shooting, and Jerry was doing the same. So one or two fellas jumped out on top, you know, and another or two stopped in the trench with their rifles ready, you know, but they didn't need. As these two fellas got up, others followed, and there were scores of us on top of finished. How did you feel about when you first got out of the oh, trench? Oh, it was grand. You could stretch your legs and run about on the hard. It was a hard surface then, you know, and on the soft clay. Do you, do you think it made a difference, the fact that those Germans were Saxon and not Prussians, perhaps? It might well, because the Prussian officers were such a tough lot, ruthless lot, that had they been in that situation, they would probably not have allowed it. Do you think it might not have happened with different British troops? Terribly hard. You see, on some occasions in war, one funny little man, maybe a private soldier, might be an NCO, might be, uh, might be an old officer, would take the lead in something. And it's possible that one of our people waved across, seen a German, waved across, I guess, with a white flag. Or, we weren't allowed white handkerchiefs, we only had the khaki ones, and drew a response to the other side. Or the Germans might have done the same. A bit of leadership that exploded at the critical moment. It does seem that these ceasefires were spontaneous and took generals by surprise when they found out. There wasn't one Christmas truce, but several events, and in some sectors, no truces at all. 77 British soldiers were killed in fighting, on Christmas Day 1914. Everyone had different experiences. George Ashurst was near Armentieres and George Jameson was stationed near Neuve Chapelle. Some Jerry's came to their wire with a newspaper and they were waving it, you know. What's that, lads? Uh, you going for it? I'm not going for it. Anyway, a corporal in our company went for it. Two of my section came dashing into the billet during the morning and said, what do you know, the Jerry's are out on the top, they're walking about, they're dishing out drinks and cigarettes, there's no fighting going on. Well, we'd noticed the place was very quiet. I said, well, I can't go, I'm, I'm duty for the morning on this, and, but hop off and see what you can find. So this corporal went, he said, I'll go for it. He got halfway and he stopped, you know. He said, he changed his mind or not. But the lads shouted, go on, go on, get, get that paper. So he did when they shouted to him like that. He went right to the wire and the Germans shook hands with him. Wishing him Merry Christmas sort of thing and give him the paper. And he came back just like a good soldier. And of course we couldn't read a word of it. So it had to go to an officer, you know, they, they got it. We did not intermingle. There was only this togetherness, say, with the Germans and us, with that one corporal going for that paper. And they arrived back round about lunchtime, <laughs> Keith with one of the landwehr hats on, you see, all that grey thing with the red band round the button. They'd had drinks, they'd had smokes, and they'd been walking about. He said, it's, he said, just wouldn't believe it. Uh, they're walking about on the top, chatting with and exchanging drinks and what not. There was no doubt about it, they were absolutely astounded at what he said. They've got a football out there, they're kicking it around, they're having a marvellous time. One of the enduring legends of the Christmas truce is that a football match was played on no man's land. References to it are vague. There could have been multiple impromptu kickabouts. Ernie Williams emerged from the Cheshire Regiment trenches, even though he was not certain about the safety of the truce. Somehow... This football appeared. It was a proper football, but we didn't form a team. It wasn't a team game in any sense of the word. It was like how I learned my football in Hillgate Streets, being chased by a policeman. You know, it was a kickabout. Everybody was having a go. We tied a sandbag up, kicked it about on top, just to keep warm, of course. Did you actually play football with it? Yes. We didn't have a match. He was kicking it from one to another all over the place, in no man's land. But you didn't play with the Germans at all? No, we didn't. Now, you see, quite a lot did up and down the place, I believe. 
but we didn't. This is coming away to symbolise the truce. And this is a bit unfortunate because if there's something that's intangible that we can't prove happened, it's football. There is evidence for it, there absolutely is. But it, it seems to melt away as you get closer to it. A, a football being booted from one side of the wire to the other, there is reference to that in, a, in, in an account. But most of the football was within their own side. So the, the British would kick some, a ball or a sandbag about on their side and the Germans might be doing the same on the other side. You know, when it comes to actually playing a game, the evidence is weak. There's talk I've heard, I never saw it, of a football being kicked about. You didn't hear of a football game in your area? No, no, yes. no we just walked about on it. It's a very hard and all broken up land. You, you, you couldn't have played if you wanted to. One of the problems with oral history that comes out in some of our interviews is that people want to be at the centre of the story and they want to have been part of the Christmas truce, they want to have been part of the famous football matches and this has led some, some people to exaggerate or lie. There are examples of this within the, the War Museum's collection and it's a shame that this has happened but it, it's human nature as well. Looking at the evidence as a whole... There does seem to have been a likelihood that uh, the first six Cheshires who were attached to the Norfolks in the line seem to have played some kind of game. I wouldn't like to say what kind of game it was, but there is quite a bit of evidence that there was some sort of game involving both the British and the Germans in no man's land. And that's as far as you can really go. And then that there are some lovely German accounts which have very slight corroboration from the British side, that there was a game with, between the Germans and the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders with lots of uh, amusing references to kilts flying up and what was and wasn't worn underneath, which bring a smile to anyone. But and, and you can tell from my voice, I want that to be true. And that's the problem. You know, we get tempted by these things. Did it happen? I don't know. Football aside, the fact that this truce happened at all is remarkable. It's miraculous that this brutal, impersonal war paused briefly when soldiers themselves made the independent decision to put down their arms rather than listen to orders. Of course, some men exaggerated, others fantasised, and there was nothing uniform about the truces. Philip Neem was a 26-year-old officer in the Royal Engineers. Five days earlier at Neuve Chapelle, he'd single-handedly attacked the Germans and checked their advance. It would win him a Victoria Cross. There was no fraternising, both our own infantry stood up and strolled about, and the Germans did too, but uh, they never got together and talked to each other at all. Uh, they, no man's land remained practically empty, and all I recollect is that both sides just strolled about uh, near their own trenches. I'll be quiet, Frank. I didn't trust them. I thought there was something wrong with the cigarettes. I didn't smoke them. You thought it was a trick, did you? I thought it could be, because there'd been a lot of atrocities that they uh, were guilty about. They hadn't uh, sort of played the game, as it were, properly, but uh, they'd ill-treated women and all sorts of things. So they weren't very popular. So I got back to the line as soon as yeah. I could. Did you feel nervous about the Germans breaking it? No. Not when there were so many of us on top. Oh, no. We knew that couldn't be so then, and we could see him knocking about all over the place. You weren't tempted at all to break it yourself? Could you oh, just no. explain why not? Not in the least. I was more tempted to keep it going for a long time. I was like a lot more. Why was that? Because it was so pleasant to get out of that trench from between them two walls of clay and walk and run about. It was heaven, you know, that. Little crosses of ration box wood were nailed together, quite small ones, and indelible pencil they would put, the Germans, for Vaterland und Freiheit, for fatherland and freedom. And I said to a German, excuse me, but how can you be fighting for freedom? You started the war. And we are fighting for freedom. And he said, excuse me, English comrade, camarade, but we are fighting for freedom for our country. And I say, you also put, here rests in God, an unbecanter, held. Here rests in God, an unknown hero. 
in God. Oh yes, God is on our side. But I said, he's on our side. And that was a tremendous shock. One began to think that these chaps, who were like ourselves, whom we liked, and who felt about the wars we did, and who said, it'll be over soon because uh, we will win the war in Russia. And we said, no, but the Russian steamroller is going to win the war in Russia. Well, English comrade, do not let us quarrel on Christmas Day. Henry Williamson interviewed for the BBC Great War series in 1964. German artillery officer Rickner was also interviewed for the programmes. He was in the front line on Christmas Day 1914, facing a French brigade. The fraternisation between the both lines uh, came to a climax when at about three o'clock in the afternoon, about 10 or 12 soldiers of our trenches and about the same number of French soldiers came to, to the middle of the two lines, uh, about 300 metres the, the trenches were from each other, and met there on the barbed wire and had champagne and wine and cigarettes to exchange. And uh, then they came back and the next day they did the same. So the, the day after that, we became strict orders not to repeat this fraternisation. You can see why the generals worried about fraternisation. Men met and questioned what they were being told and realised they had more in common with the men across the battlefield than with their own commanders. I was thinking it was altogether wrong that we are having this war. Them fellas don't want to fight hard. They're ordinary people like me. And they don't want to fight. It's the generals and them people that's starting to scrap him. I should imagine they, like us, uh, had their own opinions about war. I mean, I certainly had. I thought it, uh, it was crackers, actually. But we had a sense of duty and loyalty to our country, and they would have the same idea. But at home, far from the appalling reality of the trenches, opinions were different. We had papers come from England, accusing us of fraternising, you know, with the Germans. It had been an armistice, and it was Christmas Day. I rode back home and told them. Aye, I told them off. I said, uh, we'd just do with that parson and them fellas that's writing in them newspapers. We wanted them there in front of us instead of Jerry, so we could shoot them down. That's what we were saying. These fellas were nice and friendly across, and they were passing remarks like that, nice and safe in England, weren't they? Nothing like this truce would happen again during the war. As the fighting went on, both sides viewed the other with increasing bitterness. The generals played their part too. The following Christmas, 1915, they ordered deliberately timed machine gun barrages to drown out any sound of carol singing. Artillery officer John Wedderburn Maxwell. No, I think it's quite unique. Do you think it could have happened again at a later stage in the war? No, I don't think it could. Everybody was pretty savage by then. Two years later on the Somme, the order had gone out throughout the Guards Division, court martial any man seen fraternising in any way with the enemy. What you were suggesting, very rightly, was that it might have an effect on our willingness to fight. And that was above all things that got to be avoided in the war. You had to keep the hate going. Eventually, the ceasefires were too fragile to last much longer. It only took a flash of violence to shatter the trust on which they depended. We started drifting back, and the armistice was finished. So the place was back in your trenches. I didn't know how quick they'd do it, to do it when they'd, how quick they'd start shooting. You see? Anyway, most of us got back. But Adams wouldn't get back. And at five o'clock at tea time, a fellow walked across our trenches, going to another trench to see a pal of his. At five o'clock. How long were you walking about on top then, after one o'clock? Oh, only a few minutes. So you got back in your trench? Oh, yes, yes. What, was that a better safe than sorry attitude or what? Yes, I should think so. Yes, because you never knew what was going to happen after one o'clock. 
The Germans still occupied most of Belgium. They still occupied a significant part of France. Uh, they showed no signs of abandoning their, their militaristic policies. This was not uh, a movement for peace. It was a, just a sentimentality almost, a Christmas sentimentality. And it, it was an amazing thing. But the, the truce changed nothing, and it meant nothing. Of course, the powers that be, both on our side and the Germans, were fit to throw up, you know, about all this. And the next day, of course, that, that land where regiments were withdrawn from there and the Prussians came into there, uh, and they were shouting about, don't come any tricks today, Tommy, or you'll cop it, you see, and the fighting really did start again. One of these snobs, of people that got his, just got his commission, you know, and he come up the next day and said, this has got to cease. So um, we didn't take any notice. Or he said, give them a volley. They started to get down and we got down, but there was still a few of them knocking around. This fella come up the next day. He said, hey, you still got the armistice this day? I said, oh, yes. Picked up his rifle, he shot one of those Germans dead. Straight out in the oak. That was the end, that finished it. That war started again. Never finished in 1918, did it? The end of the truce was signaled by a salvo of artillery. Then people just reverted to living in their mud holes. Later exaggeration and mythologizing don't detract from what's one of military history's most poignant moments. The truce was a brief, tantalizing flash of individual humanity in a war of bureaucracies, machines and high explosives. For a short time, men freed themselves from the shackles of orders, rank and duty and walked across the killing zone for a cup of tea and a chat. There waiting for them was their enemy, who for that briefest of moments felt like a comrade. We got orders to come down the trench. Get back in your trenches every man. <laughs> The generals behind must have seen it and got a bit suspicious. Oh, we were crushing them to hell, us. Crushing the generals and that. You want to get up here in this stuff? Oh, mind your big giving orders and your big shot holes and driving about in your big cars. Yes, we hated the sight of bloody generals. We always did, all through the war. They gave orders for a battery of guns behind us to fire and a machine gun to open out, you know, and officers to fire their revolvers at the Jerry's, you know. Of course, that started the war again. <laughs> 